This is Git Minutes episode 11, the third part from the Git Merge conference in Berlin. Git Minutes is a show for proficient Git users, featuring stories, discussions, ideas, demos, and other things useful for those using Git today. I'm your host, Thomas Ferris Nikolaisen. You can find more information about the show on gitminutes.com. This episode is recorded on the 11th of May, 2013, and the show notes are available on links.gitminutes.com slash 11. We are back at Git Merge. It is the morning of the third day and the last day of the conference, uh, also known as Hack Day. In this session, I talk to four people. First off is Alfonso Alba. He has spearheaded a Spanish community of Git users called Aprende Git, and we'll talk about this and other things. Second, I talk to Andre Deviatkin. He comes from Ericsson with an impressive tale of Git migrations. And third up is Jens Lehmann, one of the maintainers of Git submodules. Finally, I talked to Christian Halstrick from the JGit project. So I'm standing here with uh, Alfonso Alba. Um, Alfonso, um, tell us who you are. Well, um, I'm a developer. I started uh, developing when I was uh, nine years old with a Commodore 64. And well, I uh, started using it uh, in, 19, in, 20, in 2009. Ah. So, uh, well, I do a lot of uh, PHP and, uh, and lately Rails development, so I'm switching from PHP to Rails. Cool. Uh, so, cool. Sounds like progress. Yes, it is. <laughs> and, and why are you at uh, Git Merge? Well, um, to meet uh, very all these nice people I've heard and I've read about, so I thought it was a very nice chance to, to meet them in person, so mm-hmm. that's why I'm here. And also, of course, to learn Git and to, sh- uh, to share uh, what, I, what I know. Yeah, that's the thing you and me uh, have in common is that we're kind of we're doing our share of uh, well extending the Git community. Uh, tell me a bit about your your efforts. Well, um, I, I started a blog in uh, December last year, 2012, and um, it's about a blog about Git in Spanish mm-hmm. because there are no m- that many resources in Git in Spanish and they are very uh, dispersed. So I said. I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna do that, and it's working pretty well. Mm-hmm. And I also started a, a, a small um, project company. I don't know how to call that uh, to teach Git in Spanish as well ah, there in Spain. Cool. And uh, the reason I did that was uh, because I, I was really frustrated. Uh, I had I had my company. I closed it in 2010, and uh, I had to hire a lot of people, and um, any of them really new git so it was really frustrating and i was complaining and at a certain point i re- I, re- I recall uh, something a friend of mine told me it, which is uh, if you are not part of the solution then you are part of the problem <laughs> i like that uh, i don't know why that came back to me in december and i said okay i think i have to start start stop complaining and do something about it so i started writing the blog cool so uh, i'm i'm very satisfied i'm getting very nice feedback from uh, from my colleagues there in spain so i'm i'm really i'm really happy with it that's nice. I mean, uh, back when I started blogging, you know, many many years ago, you know, I, I lived in Norway, and there's a fairly small developer community there. And I thought that, you know, when I kind of, if I would blog in Norwegian, I would kind of restrict uh, my audience to be, uh, you know, pretty small. It would just be one country. But you know, probably in Spanish, it's a bit different. Well, in Spanish, uh, well, it's a bit different because we have. Uh I don't know how many Spanish-speaking people are there in the world. I don't know the statistics of that. I know there are a lot of developers, not only in Spain, but also in Central and South America. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I, I have a potential big audience. Mm. And uh, even if it's only in Spain, I think that we need that because there is not that many places to go to read, uh, let's call it advanced articles, uh, or something different about, uh, about Git, which is not just to make a branch and, uh-huh. and uh, Git in it. So if you want to, to go farther than that, there, there's, not, there's almost anything in Spanish. In Spanish. Yeah. So I mean, it's hard for me to imagine what it's like, but uh, you know, I, I've been speaking English so long that I can't uh, remember anymore what it's like to try to read a, a, an English book uh, <laughs> without you know, properly knowing the language. Uh, well, for, for us, it's, it's really hard. Uh, I, I'm, I'm used to it, so I, 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 I'm really not buying any Spanish tr- uh, translated books. I, I don't like the translation, so I, I read mm. everything in English, and I yeah, well, buy books English, only in English. Your English is uh, awesome already, but... 
know, oh, thank for, you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I imagine, like, in no, but but for my colleagues, it's very hard. Yeah? It's really hard, and uh, it's it's if, if you if you are not used to read and and speak in English mm. and talk in English, then then it's hard to. You can do it, yeah. but it's you're not very efficient at it. Yeah. So having something in Spanish, I think it's 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 good for all yeah. of us. I mean, when I try reading a German book, I, I get bored awfully quickly. Uh, <laughs> no matter how interesting it is, it's really tiring on my brain to to to, to read something in, in like uh, you know such a foreign yeah. language. So yeah. to say. I, I am reading. I, I also train my uh, my reading English. I, I'm. Lately, I because I spent a few years. I, I I went to the Netherlands to make my PhD there. Mm -hmm. So when I came back and I did it a lot, a lot of stuff in English. Then I came back to Spain. I've been there since 2004. I came back mm -hmm. and it's almost no, no English at all. And, uh, only the technical stuff. Mm -hmm. So a few last year I started. I said, okay, I need to to start catching up again a little bit. So I, I start reading English books again. Yeah. So I'm reading this Game of Thrones. Ah, so, uh, I heard some good things about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coming back on topic, uh, how, how does this, uh, you know, the statistics look for uh, how much traffic are you getting in from South America compared to Europe? Well, I, I'm at this moment, I'm almost getting not no traffic from South America. If everything is coming from Spain. Okay. And um, uh, I'm, uh, well, uh, which is normal. I'm not doing anything really to to get into South America, so it's it's uh, it's not uh, I'm not doing anything special to go there at this moment. So okay. it's normal. It, every, uh, all my readers are from Spain now. I'm having something like maybe 150, 200 visits per day. Oh, that's nice. It's not that much, but I mean, yeah, I started in December and it's Git and it's in Spanish, so yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty satisfied with it. Yeah, but absolutely. I, 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 I'm also I have a Twitter account. Mm -hmm. So aprende git, and mm -hmm. uh, I have already a few, few hundred, I think it's more than hundred followers. Or and, and, uh, to, to be honest, I, I don't care about what uh, <laughs> how, how I'm doing with that. I'm yeah, just, you're gonna uh, you're gonna do it anyway, no matter yeah, how, how exactly. many. So like, if yeah. I'm getting uh, ten followers, it's okay. I will write for them. Yeah. So that, that's a good uh, advice for anybody starting something new, like a blog or, or a podcast. You know, do it for yourself, and whoever listens or reads will will read and listen. Yeah. Yeah, I really think so. Okay, yeah. so uh, tell us again where can people find uh, this blog and, and, and get in touch uh, with you? Well, you can find it in uh, www.aprendegit.com. Okay. And uh, Twitter is uh, aprendegit. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you can, there in the blog you can also find uh, links to Google Plus and uh, LinkedIn. So, and okay. uh, if you want to contact me directly, uh, that's gonna be funny to say, but it's uh, Alba Garcia. Uh, that's my Twitter account, or you can find just uh, you, you can just go to the to the blog and uh, in Who Am yeah. I? Then you can find me or write links to my Twitter account and everything. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll put a link uh, to Apprendigit and the other things I can find uh, in, the, thank in, you. in the show notes. And uh, well, thank you for speaking with me, Alfonso. Thank you for your time. So I'm standing here now with Andre Deviatkin. Andre, tell us who you are. Well, I'm a DevOps engineer, currently a DevOps lead engineer in Ericsson, and uh, I came here to Git Merge in Berlin to share our late experience with uh, Git migration. Migration. Yeah, it was quite big one. We spent around two years on that. Wow. <laughs> you can't imagine how long it was. But uh, just because we decided to do some pilot and uh, we were one of the first departments migrating to Git mm. inside Ericsson. So our intention here is to share our experience just to get give some tips to people and maybe save some time for them with their migrations. That's cool. And uh, Git now is, uh, and tools built around Git, it's a big part of our infrastructure and uh, it benefits our, us a lot. Mm. our business processes, our quote quality, mm. such things. So that's why we want to benefit back the community. Mm. So let's, uh, let's talk some numbers. Uh, you said two years. Uh, can you say like how you came from ClearCase, right? Yes. And how much, uh, how many people, how much code are we talking about here? Well, it's a huge source code base. It's around 10, 15 million code of lines. And that's Ouch. actually multiple languages, C and Java. And the uh, product is uh, we are producing kind of transport system, transport and control system for LT and 3G nodes mm. on a radio network. Mm. So if you hear such 
fancy words like LT. <laughs> uh, that's something we do. Okay. And the uh, project itself is around 1,000 people. Wow. And it's distributed between multiple sites around the world. Wow. Uh, that's why it's quite complicated. And uh, in some cases, people just throw old history and start a new product mm -hmm. inside Git. And in these cases, you don't have that much problems. Mm. But in our case, we uh, just continue development. And we need to extract... It was a problem, a small problem, to extract source code base from clear case. Then you need to decide how to place it in Git, how to split it, because it's quite large. Yeah, I mean, it, it was probably an all-in-one big uh, clear case repository central, no. right? In the past? Oh, yeah. It was split in the multiple, so we did restructuring. Okay. And uh, now we went with the Git submodels. But uh, before starting migration, let's say you have a company mm. and uh, you want to migrate one of the projects. Before starting, you need to ask multiple questions for yourself. Mm -hmm. And the uh, biggest uh, question is why I'm doing migration. What's wrong with uh, my previous version control system? And in most cases, it will be nothing wrong with your version control system. Maybe it's a way how you use it. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I can see, many companies have a bad habits, and uh, most of them caused by lack of infrastructure. That's why people commit binaries to repositories. Yeah. They store test results inside repositories and such things. So ex before actual migration started, it would be really good to think what infrastructure I have. And as a preparation, maybe fix such problems. Mm -hmm. This old version control system just stop storing such files in old version control system. Yeah, I mean, if not, you're just going to recreate the same problems yeah, in your, in exactly, your next uh, exactly. version control. And uh, you need to think in advance how I split my source code base. Mm -hmm how it will look like in five years, how mm. I will handle this history, and uh, what's a branching strategy I should choose. So how many, how many repositories did you end up splitting into? How many Git repositories well, do you have now? Uh, right now, a source code base split it in uh, 10 repositories, something like that. And uh, they are in total 10 gigabytes. Wow. Everything. But, uh, Those are some few big uh, repositories, I have to say. Yeah, it's quite huge. And does Git work uh, good enough for you in, in this case? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah? And, Compared with clear case. And can you tell us a bit about how your uh, Git infrastructure looks like? Do you uh, what, what kind of hosting you use internally for uh, storing the repositories? Uh, or? We, we decided to use Garrett uh -huh. to, for access control and such things to enforce code review and have uh, wow. build verification before changes go in. Uh, that works really well for us. And uh, then uh, we are using some virtualization, basically, terminal servers. Mm. And then we have a uh, shared drive there with uh, really aggressive caching. Mm. So it works quite fast. So it's interesting how you kind of... Did you introduce a code review at the same time, or was that yes, something... Yes, uh, so it was quite hard changing. Wow. Uh, quite, quite big mind shift for all our developers. Yeah, I can imagine. Like, um, not only do they have to learn Git, they also have to kind of get into the whole uh, code review rhythm. Yeah, that's pretty that's impressive. The thing. We didn't really push for that that much. We say, like, it's up to your team to choose a style as you do it. Mm -hmm. You can have it as mandatory. You can decide who does what. Or maybe you can just approve yourself. In yeah. my opinion, it's not the best idea <laughs> ever. But if you have no choice and you need to deliver some code during the weekdays where you don't have your teammates with you, but yeah. maybe it's only one way. So something like this. Wow, okay. So uh, yesterday was a uh, user day uh, here at Git Merge. Mm. And uh, you did a uh, lightning talk and, and had like a birds of a feather discussion about Git, uh, Git yeah, migrations? Yeah, we, pr we presented our experience, such mm -hmm. key things that you should think about. Some of them I already mentioned, like infrastructure preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the problems for us. That's why it took so long. Mm -hmm. We didn't really thought about infrastructure and such bad habits we had. And when you are changing version control system, it's a, normally it's a, one of the basic bricks in your infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So you will have to update everything. Yeah. And uh, that's why it's better to prepare for this. And most probably some old problems will show up. Something yeah. that you forget about. So you should have a really good buffer of time mm. when you're doing a planning of this migration. 
And uh, uh, in the, during the Birds of Feather discussion, what kind of uh, new things did you learn from the other people who, who participated in the discussion? Um, as most of the people who attend uh, attending discussion, they are migrating from SVN. Ah, okay. And the uh, biggest problem for them, as I see, is that they cannot actually finish migration. Uh -huh. So they establish a bridge between SVN and Git, and yeah. that seems to work. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, after it, some people don't really want to migrate mm -hmm. till the end. I mean, they find uh, SVN works for them fine, and some people use Git, and then you need to take a decision here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time uh, figuring out uh, making Git SVN bridges uh, uh, in, in, in my own career, mm -hmm. and I think you know even my little company where I work now. Uh, we set up a Git SVN bridge and it was running for like half a year mm -hmm. before we finally cut it out and moved to Git uh, completely. Um, and this was for like a small team of five developers. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't imagine how it's possible with a, with a thousand people. <laughs> and uh, that's another thing that I want to brought up here that when you're doing such migration, I mean, when you finished with all preparations, mm -hmm. you need to set up a criteria for immigration. Mm -hmm. You need to have a criteria when you can consider it done. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have a possibility to never stop. Yeah, exactly. You will just continue, 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 improve something. Mm -hmm. Something will be always broken and you will have to fix it all the time. For us, it was to do um, three minor releases in the row. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, that worked fine. We are doing minor releases every three weeks. Cool. So it took around three months of that actual migration. Preparation took one year and a half. Okay. But actual migration took one, like three months. And main reason for such long preparation was our bad experience a few years ago when we migrated on some proprietary solution uh -huh. based, built on top of the base clear case. Uh -huh. And it took around eight months just to get things up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this time... We prepared really well, and uh, when our project manager asked me, like, Andre, what is the chance to go back to this hell we got a few years ago? I said, you know, me and my colleague, Peter Jonsson, we spent two years of our life for this. <laughs> Failure is not an option. <laughs> yeah. And uh, actual... There's no going back now. <laughs> yes, true, true. And actual migration went really well, but only because of the really great commitment from the team. In the end, during migration, we were about 10 people. Mm. And uh, it's amazing people. And that's another point for you to consider when you're preparing migration. You should go best people. Yeah. And uh, Peter, the guy that I mentioned before, he initially started at Pilot. Mm -hmm. And then he brought me after a few months or so, one or two months of the pilot, and then together we build a team mm -hmm. just for this migration. That was a really great team. But that's a really strong point. You should have a really good team. At some moment of time, you can get in a trouble with the tools you are using, mm -hmm. like it happened uh, with us, with Garrett. Yeah. One of the features of Garrett doesn't really work as we expect it to work. And uh, then Peter spent some time on fixing it. And we, then we contribute this fix back oh. So, yeah. so you should be ready for such situations. Yeah. So the, the, the key is to have a, a great team of migrators that will pull things through till the end. Yeah, people who know your source code base because you can get the problems actually with your source code. Yeah, so you can't just rely on some external Git consultant to come in and fix stuff or you need to, you need to have it on the inside. I don't have a strong opinion about that. Maybe if they're super mega professionals, maybe. <laughs> you never know, but... You need to make sure that they are. Mm, exactly. And uh, let's say for us, it was quite surprising problem that um, clear, clear case is not only a version control system. It provides you a distributed file system. Mm -hmm. So you can have uh, absolute path to your file everywhere. Mm. And uh, our source code base, all our scripts, mm. build configuration files, was full of those yeah. <laughs> absolute passes. And it took quite much time just to get rid of absolute passes. In some systems like SVN, people already 
have this problem. So they use relative paths, maybe environment variables to resolve this problem. But you need to consider such things. Mm. It could be some surprises that you do not expect. Okay. And uh, maybe another point that we learned, there is few features to keep multiple repositories together, like git subtree merge, git some models, uh, rep repo tool used by Android developers. Mm -hmm. You can use them to keep your source code base together. But before doing that, ask yourself why I want to have my source code together. If it's only because you build it together, then probably you need to consider using the right tool for that, R right uh, dependency handler. Mm -hmm. Let's say if you're doing Java, you can use Maven or something like this. And uh, tool. Um, the Git is really great tool, but if you use it right, exactly for the right things. So, uh, before we finish off, is there like a, a place where you kind of uh, made a write-up of uh, your experiences, or like a blog post from Ericsson or something like that? Um, not really. I didn't really got the time to <laughs> write something <laughs> wow. like that because now I'm started with another project and you know, uh -huh. it's like a queue of projects that you need to fix. Okay. Well, well, on on your ride home. <laughs> yeah, maybe <laughs> someday. Maybe you can sketch up a few notes and 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 share and share it. Will be really interesting to see. And uh, if you do, let me let me know and. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll I put can it try the... to prepare some kind of summary to notes for this talk. Cool, cool. At okay. least main points that I'd like to highlight. Excellent. I'll be sure to uh, put that into the show notes if I get some. Yeah, and uh, then I can put it to uh, Google Plus Git community. I'm somewhat active there. Cool, cool. Okay, Andre, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. So, I'm now standing here with Jens Lehmann. Jens, uh, right. tell, us, tell us who you are. Yes, uh, I'm the submodule maintainer together with Heiko Vogt in Git, and that's why I'm here at the Git Merge. Mm -hmm. And so we are trying to make submodules uh, better and usable, more usable for people. Cool. So um, we're now on uh, like the hack day, the third day of Git Merge. You were also here for the, uh, the developer day, right. was like the first day. Yes. Did, you get, did you get like any kind of feedback or something from uh, the other developers, maybe the users yesterday, like on what are the what's the what's the usage and and maybe problems with submodules today? Actually, I was hoping to get some user feedback, which didn't turn out that well. Um, when I believe the uh, the polls of the Git survey, about thirty percent of the people who participated are using submodules. Mm -hmm. um, two showed up yesterday, which I hope would be more. <laughs> Con considering that 300 per uh, persons were registered for this event. Uh, I actually did get some feedback and was discussing some questions regarding the next big step in submodules tools on the developer day, mm -hmm. together with other core developers. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to doing that big next step and yeah, I'm doing a big step towards that step today. So uh, t tell us from you know the, the author side, what, what is the... Uh purpose of submodules? Actually, it has different purposes. The, ma the main thing is that you get a whole Git repository under a directory into another Git repository, mm -hmm. but the use cases for it are very different. So you can have the use case that you want to have shared code, which is the th uh, main thing we use in the company I work with mm -hmm. and is one of the itches I'm scratching by working on submodules. Mm -hmm. So you can have something like a libxml or something, and um, you can develop it independently of the projects using it, while still connecting the history of the, of the projects which use it in a one-to-one -one condition with uh, a certain commit of the submodule mm. or the upstream. So it's kind of like an include dependency uh, source code into my project. Right. That's, that's one of the, of the main, main use cases for submodules. Mm -hmm. um, Another one is um, stuff that is large, like big media files, which take a long time to start or to check out. Mm. Um, you can have them inside a submodule and say, okay, I never want to see if there's any difference in, in there and want, don't want to update it. And I don't not need to clone it every time I clone the super project. Mm. I only clone this if I need access to these huge files. Okay. Um, so it's kind of a, of a early version of a sparse checkout. Okay. So, um, what other kind of maybe explain to you what I, how I use submodules personally, or how I you know thought I was going to use submodules and then I didn't. Uh, first of all, I use uh, I use like Vim, and I have a lot of different um, plugins uh, to Vim that I include. 
and and they need to be source based. So I think that's a fine area of you know linking in uh, you know various Git repositories that are you know Vim plugins yeah. into my .vim directory. Uh, so you know uh, they get included in my configuration and then I can also easily update them whenever the time comes that I want to upgrade. Sure. And I think that's a nice you know, use case where I, want to, I need to include the source. And, and the other case where I wanted to use submodules was that we had like a, a project that had a lot of modules. It used yeah. to be in one big subversion repository, of course. But now we, uh, we split them into multiple Git repositories. And even they, they can be built separately from each other. Uh, they communicate with each other either through you know APIs or they use some web service maybe to communicate with each other. But they share you know versioning and release cycle. So, but still they're split in separate repositories. So every time I want to do something, typically with our product, I need to check them out all at the same time. When I make a branch, I usually branch all of them at the same time because. From inside the umbrella project you're talking about. Exactly, yeah. umbrella project. That's my use case. Yes. Is, is, uh, and then we ended up uh, thinking, well, Git submodules aren't right because they need to link to a specific revision of the submodule. Or, and, and, uh, and it's kind of frozen time. And every time we want to upgrade one of the submodules, we kind of need to do some operations. To, yes. Yeah. But actually, that's, that's some kind of a uh, feature. And if you look at it from the QA side, it's very helpful to have an exact version of the submodule. Um, recorded in the super project because you know exactly what part of this uh, library or this uh, umbrella mm. project part you're referring to. And yeah. if your uh, continuous integration server says this build in the super project is fine, you might want to know which part of yeah. the super modules were involved. If, if that happens, we're pretty, uh, we're kind of screwed if uh, we need to chase down the bugs that happened uh, in some version of a repository. Yeah, you but, might be able to, to look in the uh, you know, uh, Jenkins server to find out what was the hash of the, that particular repository at yeah. that time. Yeah. So we would be able to track it down that way, I suppose. But we, we kind of take the chance. and we Right now, we're just rolling. We're using uh, Git Slave to check out many repositories and branch them at the same time. And we also tag them with the same tag name. So we kind of have that convention that we know that, okay, this tag is uh, the I'm, same across these I'm repositories. I'm not deeply familiar with Git Slave, but as far as I understand it, it just goes down into each of the submodules and does the same operation, which it does in the super project there, too. Exactly. So if you branch it or tag it, it just goes down. Yeah, it's like um, a I think it's just an indication that the dash dash recurve submodules option is missing from commands like tag and branch. Mm -hmm. So um, it is a, a, a valid extension of Git with this tool, but I suspect that someday Git's core can do it for itself. Um, for some project, that makes perfect sense to go in there. For others, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, when you work on libxml and your project is, say, the Firefox browser, mm. um, then fixing some kind of user interface thingy with libxml makes no sense as a commit message inside libxml because it doesn't know about the browser using it. Yeah. So um, that's the hard lesson I learned is that has even more use cases. We talked about three. I have another one, which is private directories. Mm -hmm. So if you have sensitive stuff like passwords or stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you can put in the submodule and not push that out. So you can allow people to crown from you without having your super secret third something key, okay. um, uh, which makes a different submodule uh, usage possible. And then tracking isn't that important. You might want to turn off to see any differences in that um, submodule. So um, we came here with at least four use cases, and I think there's people out there having different use cases for them, like floating submodules and stuff. Is, is um, that like what I need, uh, floating submodules? No, I don't think so. I think you still want to co uh, record the correct submodule commit in your umbrella project, right? Oh, okay, yeah. Then you're not going to need floating submodules. Okay. Um, there's already uh, also two kinds of floating submodules. People tend to mix them up. Uh, one is just follow a branch in the submodule. Okay. And Git can do that. Since recently Git learned the dash dash remote option for the Git submodule update. Mm -hmm. And when you recorded a branch at the submodule add time, um, it will follow and check out the tip and fetch all the stuff and show you that there's a new version of that branch available in your submodule, which you then can commit. Okay. But it's still these, uh, the, the model that you have a certain version of the submodule fixed to the commit in the super project. 
Uh, some people want a different version. I, I just want to have the newest of that branch. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm okay with that, even though I don't use it, because I want to have the one-to-one -one, mm. um, binding between the, the submodule contents and the super project. But if people are fine with it, um, they can basically disable um, the, the diff option for the for the submodule, so they don't see any changes there, mm -hmm. and have the little helper script just checking out the, mass, uh, the branch, whatever they want, inside the submodule. Mm -hmm. um, so we have two use cases inside the floating submodule use case. Okay. And as I said, I expect that people are very ingenious and, and trying um, to always find new use, uh, use cases for submodules. And the hard part is to evolve submodules to make them more usable without breaking any users' expectations and use cases. Yeah, exactly. And you want to keep that backward compatibility and, yeah, and stuff exactly. in there. So um, what, what features are in the works uh, for, for submodules that we should be eagerly expecting I think the big thing is the recursive submodule update. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the history when I took over uh, hacking on submodules like three or four years ago, um, they were basically working. Lars Hemley, I think, did the most most of the work. And um, you could record the commits, you could add submodules, you could update them. But A, you never saw what happened inside the submodules. So if you made a change inside, it was easy to be, uh, to be forgotten. Mm -hmm which could break um, the, the build for other users or the build system. And also, um, you had explicitly to ask git submodule update to update the work trees. Yeah. And um, the first step we said is to make people aware of what happened inside a submodule. Mm. This was the first step of events. Um, the next was, um, let's fetch everything from upstream from the submodules, which is reference in the super project. A, we, when you get on a plane, having, fetch, having done a fetch in a super project, uh, we're making sure that you have everything you have inside the submodules fetch too. You need to check out that part in the super project. Uh -huh. This all was like laying the groundwork for the stuff we're working now on, to come back to your initial question, which is to do the recursive update so mm -hmm. that you get rid of the extra state of doing a good submodule update. And to... Uh, just say to the users who don't want that, you can, you have to turn it on, especially in the first place. And even if you make it a default later, uh, we'll be happy to provide an option to turn it off if you yeah. don't want that. <laughs> Because as I said, there are many more use cases than sub -use, of sub use than mm. um, I thought of when I started working on them. I mean, I, l I like to think that people who are already using submodules know them pretty well, know them well enough to be aware that they should a add a new flag at some point when they upper Git. Yeah, that but you know what is? You don't always read the release notes that carefully, and no. sometimes you get surprised by changes. Um, but I think um, all this tends to help the, the user which expects submodules just to work in the case that you incorporate yeah, yeah. another project in there. Exactly. Um, and then it will you will see what, what happens there. We already have that state. And you, it will also follow automatically when you check it out in the super project, mm. which I think is um, the, the most prominent use case uh, I heard of. Does that mean when I clone a, a project a repository with submodules that the submodules will be automatically cloned We'll come as well? to that when we talk about the future. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is about uh, checking out um, those submodules which you showed interest in by doing a get submodule in it mm -hmm. and wanted to see them. Um, this gets rid of um, having to have a Git submodule update every now and then when uh, the super project changes and has another record, uh, commit recorded. Nice. Um, Bisect will work automatically. You can't forget anymore that you have to issue a Git submodule update after each Bisect step wow. in case a submodule changed. Um, we had nasty merge conflicts where I work because when you have a merge conflict, it would show you, show you the conflicts and it won't have updated the submodules. So you see, they are modified. Um, so if you forget to run a git submodule update there, um, you might have rewound the submodule to some stage earlier, breaking the merge. So um, I think this will all go away with the thing we are currently working on, the recursive submodule checkout, and I hope it will make a lot of people much happier with submodules. And um, yeah, that's cool. Um, what's the time frame on the, on the, on this recursive uh, feature? Yeah, I was hoping to have it like a few years ago, so <laughs> I won't promise anything here because <laughs> that was in the details and you know um, don't know exactly how long it takes. I have a working version which I'm uh, using for quite some time now myself, uh -huh. and I think it's in a, in a pretty good shape right now. 
The unfortunate thing is I have to add all the config options to all the work tree com um, changing commands. And um, there should be tests for them too, right? Yeah, so exactly. I'm having a good <laughs> to write a ton of tests. So that'll take some time. So yeah, um, I can't promise anything, but I hope to finish it this year. And how will uh, sub-modules evolve into the future? The next important step we have after the recursive update is that you can automatically clone the submodules on the initial clone of the super project, so you don't have to have the get, uh, git submodule update dash dash init afterwards. You can do it right now if you use the dash dash recursive uh, option to git clone, uh -huh. but we want to have it working from other tools like git GUI and so automatically. Yeah. So we tend to issue, uh, to add something like an auto init flag, so that you can not only say, okay, these submodules should be automatically updated when they are present, but you can also say, oh, these submodules should be present and maybe these not. So um, I think this is the next big step for the user to see after recursive checkout materializes hopefully soon. Cool. Are you, are you looking for help or contributors? To sure. I, I could always use help for that. And um, I always have small manageable tasks um, Concerning submodules, there's lots of other stuff uh, which mm. could be improved. Um, you can check my GitHub site for that, okay. which, which I have um, set up especially for that. And feel free to contact me if you want to want to help there. So uh, tell us your contact information. We'll include it in the show notes as well. But uh, it's J Lehman, J L E H M A W -N, N mm -hmm. at GitHub, and there you find the Git submodule at enhancement mm -hmm. uh, repository. And I have a wiki site up there, which which tells you about the active uh, development. Ah, so basically the things you told me now, uh, are they you know, well described in the wiki there? So people can get a, like an overview of current state? I hope state so, and, and if not, tell me and describe them better. Okay, that's good to know. And otherwise people, I'm sure you frequent the Git developer mailing list. Are you also sure. on I IRC or something like that? Not that often, because uh, in the daytime I have to work, and in the okay. uh, spare time I do the hacking, and I'm more um, reachable by the mailing yeah. list. But it's all also GitHub-based, or is it more mailing list? Uh, do, you, do you use like the GitHub issues and stuff for picking up bugs and suggestions? Not yet, but if an issue would be open there, I'll be happy to respond to that. Cool. Okay, Jens. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'm standing here with Christian Halstrick. Uh, Christian, just tell us who you are. Yeah, as you said, my name is Christian Halstrick. I'm a committer to the JGit uh, project. And yeah, uh, I'm working since, I think, 2009 on that project. Uh, that's a nice experience. Cool. <laughs> Very good. I, I mean, we, we kind of touched on JGit and almost every episode of Git Minutes we had is like always somebody has uh, some use, had some use for it. Um, can you uh, tell us what you know like about how or why JGit was started? Oh, I, uh, sadly I wasn't there when, when JGit was really born. I think I know the father of JGit, uh, <laughs> Sean, Sean O'Pierce from mm -hmm. uh, Google. Uh, he he was doing that I think in the beginning quite alone or with uh, some other guy Robin Rosenberg and some other colleagues but I was coming into that team uh, when it was already uh, yeah, when the basic things were already set up mm. and uh, first thing was for example uh, merge operations were missing in Jagged and that was my, my first topic there cool uh, but you, you work for SAP right? Yes, I, I work for SAP. And uh, it's not, it wasn't just a hobby working on Jagged. It's actually like no. a company uh, investing uh, thing going on there. Can you, can you tell us a bit about why uh, SAP kind of goes so heavily into Jagged as they did and are doing? Um, okay, I mean, uh, they were definitely searching for, uh, uh, in their, for their development infrastructure for a version control system. Uh, and also one uh, version control system which allows like uh, easy con to get contributions. There's this committer contributor model. Uh, they would, I think, they would like to uh, look into that area also and uh, find out which tools would support this uh, mode best. Yeah, and then they really picked a few people, mm -hmm. a few developers, and said, okay. Uh, we would like you to, to contribute to the JGit project and to the eGit project mm. because we would like to use it in our internal development infrastructure. So it was kind of like having the Eclipse plug in there uh, was the, the primary motive yes. early on. I mean, the, the SAP 
is doing a lot with Eclipse and for a longer time. And therefore, if they choose at one point in time uh, that they would look at Git, then it was a clear decision and an easy decision. Okay, we have to invest in eGit and JGit. Mm. And and how's it gone from there? Now there's also a few other uh, JGit based projects out there. Uh, you're you at least you know that about them, but you, even though you focus mainly on JGit, yes, apart, my apart from eGit, there's, there's yes, there's uh, for example Garrett, mm. the review system which uses uh, JGit uh, internally here. There are of course uh, uh, IDE integrations, I think, which which use uh, JGit. Mm -hmm. So all the Java-based tools, uh, I think, if they want to have uh, Git functionality, then they have no big alternatives yeah. <laughs> than to, to to call native Git and, and, and parse <laughs> and the output. There were some interesting rumors uh, going around yesterday about somebody making a Java wrapper around libgit too. Yeah, right, right. To, <laughs> to, to do the same thing. Well, what do you what do you think about an idea like that? Um. Okay, in the moment, I, I wouldn't see a big, big uh, benefit in that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay, that's maybe uh, biased <laughs> or like, yeah, some view on it from a jagged developer. But uh, uh, so, I mean, this depends, of course, how how libgit two uh, evolves, and if in the end, I mean, there's a lot of uh, functionality which we don't have. Uh, of course, I can understand the. Uh, Mm. Uh, the motivation for that, but I think currently uh, it's that is not like that. <laughs> so, mm. so uh, the, the reason why I mean you're going for uh, or why people need to use JGit instead of doing something you know yeah. with pure Git, I suppose, is has performance reasons. It kind of yeah, boils sure. down to that, sure. and and JGit is used both. Uh, you know, for uh, good performance on 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 both clients and on the server side. Yes, can, right. Can you tell us a bit more about you know why is JGit so uh, performant performant on on the server side starting up there? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the biggest reason is uh, the developers behind uh, JGit, especially uh, uh, you know, on Google, like Sean. I think they they always had in mind that JGit is also used for was a server-side product like Carrot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, they know also a lot about uh, native Git and performance uh, optimizations there. And so I think just very performance-oriented developers uh, which have the real need to have a uh, well-performing JGit on the server-side. Mm -hmm. So that was the main reason. And... Uh, for example, especially like uh, protocol optimizations and now the upcoming feature of having bitmaps stored along pack files. This makes uh, JGit in the moment a very good performing uh, yeah, module on the server side. Mm -hmm. So it, it basically, if we compare it to, uh, well, we know that you know, pure Git uh, is kind of useless on the server side because of a lot of legacy reasons. And then yeah. there's libgit2, which is perfectly usable on the server side. And, and GitHub, uh, as uh, Vicente was talking about yesterday, is well, libgit2 is, is, is great for using on the server side, at least yeah. in the Unix environment, uh, right. and when you're not on the JVM. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, but JGit kind of, you know, even though it's Java, which has like a certain runtime overhead, uh, in some areas can even, you know, outperform uh, native Git or libgit. Beca yeah. because of these uh, optimizations with 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 caching or yeah. uh, or this bitmap can you can you kind of tell us a bit more more or try to make the average uh, yeah. user git user listener <laughs> understand why these bitmaps are so important for yeah. performance yeah i mean if you if you clone for example a big uh, repository and you watch exactly what is what is on the console for example you see that that these servers spend a lot of time in Especially also this like counting objects phase. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a phase where uh, the server, if you want to clone or fetch, uh, tries to find out which objects he has to send to you. And uh, yeah, on, on huge repositories, that is a very very demanding operations. You have to hop from every commit to every parent and to all the parents. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, yeah, that is especially. 
demanding because we have to set up such a big matrix of uh, dependencies. Like, mm. okay, what object is referenced uh, by which other object? So such a such matrix you have to build up, and uh, yeah, that's that is especially exactly the information which we in JGit in the moment uh, cache in yeah. bitmap files. And this this counting phase, if you look at it now, if you have a JGit based uh, server and a native Git based server, and you come with a with a native Git client, for example, and clone both, mm -hmm. then you will see that. Uh, Currently, <laughs> maybe it's not a long time that this, this situation is true, but currently uh, 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 the jacket behaves very well there in this in this phase, and this sometimes has cloned a repo before the native Git server has even counted the objects. Wow, I mean that's kind of cool that uh, you in this area. So for big uh, Git repositories that are served uh, using jacket, uh, doesn't matter if the if the client is uh, using normal Git or Or Java Git, uh, JGit. I think that doesn't matter. No. Cool. So, so any JGit served repository uh, with a fresh version of JGit, yeah. I suppose, would just be cloned much faster. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. That's really cool. Yeah. Right. I mean, so, we are not. I think uh, it's important that we are not really trying in the moment here to, to <laughs> outperform. I mean, we discussed with with, with uh, uh, I think these uh, native Git uh, team. We, we learned that uh, the day before yesterday also has. Mm. Similar ideas in mind, and we are sharing, of course, the experiences, especially the experiences we we have with our solution. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, we we, that team also. we talked a bit with Path uh, yesterday, and uh, it's really interesting to see. Like, yeah, you're you're kind of. Uh, Stealing the the good ideas of each other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, okay. that's not stealing. It's, I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of natural. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, uh, cooperation, and uh, so. Here at uh, uh, Git Merge, it uh, seems to be a very big libgit2 uh, uh, <laughs> convention. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of the uh, developers here, like we talked about yesterday. And uh, But in JGit, you're not so well represented uh, this time? That's true, yeah. H how's the community uh, around JGit? How does it actually work? Yeah, I mean, this has evolved in, in the last, uh, yeah, let's say, year also very well. I mean, we have now in, in JGit... Uh, quite broad uh, uh, number of committers and contributors mm -hmm. so it is not uh, dominated in the moment by any party uh, and that's for me very good in the beginning of JGIT it was always that you needed a certain developer like Sean for example for, for reviewing or mm. Robin and uh, this has now really changed we have people from, from GitHub from, from different companies and Uh, that worked very well, especially because we are using in with, for our JGIT development Garrett yeah. heavily this review system, and this makes it easy to also to onboard new uh, new committers. Mm. Or you know, uh, yeah, I can imagine that like in from the sidelines from uh, you know people like Android developers that they they come up with new needs for their Garrett instance because yeah. you know Garrett is kind of heavily used uh, in and around. Uh, Android, like this is Ionogen mod project for Android. Mm. They also use Garrett. I've seen that. And all of these guys kind of probably probably eventually trickle into the JGIT uh, community mm. and to help out. Yeah, right. I mean, and it's, it's, uh, it's very easy to help out. I mean, you don't destroy stuff if you propose something. It's first just a, a proposal and it is built already, tests are run already. And so you see quite good weather uh, uh, proposals from new people, for example, uh, uh, mm. the quality of that. So y you're kind of like a code review driven community, uh, yes. which which Git in itself <laughs> is as well. And you, you have a, like a bit of a fancier web interface. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, so what uh, what other ways do you uh, meet and communicate with each other uh, in, in the community? Do you have like meetups or anything like that? No, we don't uh, meet. Personally, only on such conferences like here. Okay. I mean, I think ev nearly everything is on on the ma on the mailing list. Okay. Or on on yeah on mails and also on. I mean, we really communicate over Garrett. Mm. I mean, I think I would say that eighty percent of my communication with the other team members is not by standard mails or even personal communication. <laughs> It is by by commenting code and. Uh, cool. Uh, 
Yeah, it's really, really fascinating for for someone like me who's not really done any serious kind of code review, <laughs> uh, yeah, as of yet. But it certainly sounds like an interesting way of, of working. Um, so, uh, any uh, things or projects or the things that you would like to promote uh, be, before we finish up? No, nope, currently <laughs> not. <laughs> Just to go go to Jagged. Uh, yeah, uh, right. Find, find Jagged and, and contribute. <laughs> yeah, if you're, I mean, if you're a Java developer and you need Git functionality, I mean, then you should really look at it. And I mean, we have also a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, tests where you can very easily find out how to use Jagged uh, API. Cool. That's maybe the f best thing to, to learn, Jagged. Cool. Yeah. Okay, Christian, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of this episode. Once again, you can find the show notes on links.getminus.com slash 10. You can post feedback or comments directly under the show notes, or you can just send me an email. That's feedback at gitminus.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Google+, Plus, where you'll be notified of any new episodes, or you can subscribe to the RSS feed, and you can also find us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, the Moral Guide, and in the Windows podcast directory. Thanks to Google for powering the podcast feed with Blogger and FeedBurner. Audacity is the free open source uh, audio editing tool, which I use for putting the show together, and a big thanks to danosongs.com for providing free music to the show. Until next time, thank you for listening.